branches. Good morning, branches. Look at this. It's the first time in a long time that we've greeted you without guitars in our... Oh, in yeah. Our, We're just going to head right on into the world. Oh, like it's been like since <laughs> yesterday. Mm -hmm. I want... And, and that allows me to save you into a big thanks to... Donna, yes, Donna, and Regina, Wendy. and Wendy and Eric, Eric for yes. joining us on the roundtable discussion. We, we really enjoyed it. I, they, I'm sure they said that they really enjoyed it. They liked that format, and so we're really we're hoping that we can get more more of the branches involved in yes. this. You know, the the more the merrier. As I said in that broadcast, I, I'm I'm very. I'm very curious, and I like to hear how the Holy Spirit is speaking and giving understanding and wisdom to other people other than, than just Anne and I. You know, and I know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to to everyone. Yes. You know, when we, when we read the when we're reading the Word of God, you know, it, it all it all comes, um, and it's one thing to talk about it over coffee. You know, some people have, a, they don't have a problem sitting with friends in, in their kitchen and, and, and talking about the Lord, but in a, in a situation where it's a, all, I won't call it a formal Bible study, but you know, we're all together and just, some people just are still kind of afraid to give their opinion. And, and uh, I'm hoping that you won't be, you right. know, we, we really want to hear what everybody, what yeah. the Lord is saying, because, uh, the Lord speaks, as you know, the Lord speaks differently to everybody, mm -hmm. um, even with Anne and I. The Lord speaks different to me than oh, what yes. he does to Anne mm -hmm. because we're different. We're different personalities. Mm -hmm. You're different personalities. But together we are to join together in the bond, the unity of the spirit. We become the body yeah. of Christ. And it's it's really cool to see. And it, and it's, and uh, Anne and I are encouraged whenever we hear, you know, you expressing your thoughts expressing how you understand certain certain you know we love we go back and listen to these broadcasts but not so much listen to what we had said but we, we're reading the live chat because the there's the live chats are it's very interesting the conversations that go on go on there you know and there's there's kind of a separate bible study going on there with you know mm -hmm. and and that's a good thing we're trying to encourage that so um i don't think we're going to do one this week are we oh. going to be next week yeah, next week, because we're trying to figure out how to get our Zoom Pro to work on YouTube. So, what's that plus sign doing now? Oh, you goodness. noticed that? <laughs> Anyways, so, once we, we figure out that, then we will be going live. Yep, yep. Yeah. So, but don't let that scare you. No, no, that's for and, us, not for you. And and if not, we'll just do it the way we did it. We'll just have to, like, we do these Bible studies. We record them yeah. beforehand. And thank you, Eric, for the Bible reading. Yes, yes. That was it, awesome, if you dude. haven't If you haven't heard brother, Eric, brother Eric Gillespie, Wendy's, <laughs> Wendy's husband, read the Bible, you are really missing a blessing. And right. he has agreed Gifted, to, to, yeah. to read some of these passages for us. So... I know you'll be blessed because we were really blessed. We were we were shocked when he when he read it. It was just like wow. Well, you certainly were. You I know. was. I'll, I'll pay you, you, Eric. I'll, I'll pay, pay you. you. I'll pay oh. you. You know, because we all <laughs> read love, the Bible. We all, to me. we all love just huh? <laughs> audio, audio Bibles. We all have you know a set that we have. I don't know. Some of us are old enough to remember Alexander Scorby, uh, yeah. the voice of the National Geographic. I sent my and, dear sister, that whole series. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Him reading the Bible is a blessing. I thought that uh, James Earl Jones, when I heard that he had read the Bible, I was kind of, I was kind of disappointed in his reading. But I mean, just having well, that voice, the Lord. just having the voice of Darth Vader read the Bible is is. Shall we get started? No, let's continue talking about this. Oh, okay. I would prefer we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we decided Seriously? we decided tonight it's one, of those, it's one of those nights we were just kind of like should we do we feel like doing music and, and we don't we don't if we don't feel led to do it if we if, if it's just eh, then we just no we'll just we'll go straight into the Bible study so back to the music tomorrow but um, right now 
we are going to we the oh, round table prayer. talked about Job mm -hmm. seven. Yeah, you go right ahead, honey. You open in prayer today. We don't <laughs> open in prayer. We only close in prayer. Well, I don't know where you got this opening prayer thing. <laughs> we, we suddenly started doing an opening prayer. I mean, you do sometimes, but I I I've never. Oh, felt, okay. Oh. I've, I've never felt, I, I like to get into the study and then we thank God to see where we're going. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. I'll open in prayer. Okay. We thank you for the revelation that you're giving to us and for showing, illuminating it to our spirit, Lord, and how it applies to our own lives individually. Lord, may we see um, everything that you want us to see in the word today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That was good, hon. Lovely. Do we sound like an old married couple? <laughs> we love each other. <laughs> anyway, the round table we discussed Job's um, response to Eliphaz's opening salvo uh, in uh, Job 7. Today we are going to be introduced to a, a new character, another friend of uh, Job's. Whose name is Bill Dad? Bill Dad, what a starting, name! Starting in chapter. Give me the Bill Dad. A. <laughs> um, before we start, before before we start reading, um, I thought it would be interesting because I wondered this myself. These are names that, of course, they 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 come from. They come out of the ancient Near East. And as you know, and, and we've talked about this before, names in the Bible have meanings. Have meaning. and have Very important, important when they name their children. And I, I for one, had never realized, I'd never looked up what Job's name means. Because because everybody reads Job, they, you know, we, we kind of were so used to seeing that word, we really don't know. But do you know what Job's word, what his name means? I was very surprised to read this. Job, in Hebrew, in the Hebrew, the, uh, the Hebrew version of the book of Job, Job means foe. It means hostile one. It means, and it comes of, uh, from the original Hebrew word that means to hate, to be an enemy. When I read that, those mm -hmm. meanings of Job, I'm trying to relate, okay, how... Does a name like this reflect the type of personality that Job is? We know Job as a righteous man. We know Job as as following his heart is with the Lord. And yet, his name like is foe. Name. Means hmm. to hate, to, to be an enemy. An enemy of who? Well, certainly an, an enemy of everything that that is not of God, which would be Satan. But I just, uh, I, I'm... I, I'm not giving you a definitive explanation here of the name. What, I, what I'm saying, and I'm making you aware of it because as we go through this study in Job, I want to see how, as the book unfolds, how this name kind of is 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 pertinent to a lot of the topics that we're talking about in the mm -hmm. book of Job because it isn't mm -hmm. that that isn't what I expected that the name Job would mean you know, foe or hostile one. Um, it may sound like, it may sound like in some of his choice, he's certainly hostile to his friends. And he sounds like in certain places, he might be hostile towards God because of his situation. We'll just have to look and see. Again, I, I'm not giving, I can't give you a definitive reason now why this makes any sense. Because in a way, to me, it does. I don't know about you. Hon. Yeah. Um, mm -mm. Eliphaz, whom we have just met, he has. Uh, there's two. Um, there's two meanings to his. The second one being the more prominent one because it's based on two Hebrew words. But first of all, it can be it can be translated as God is victorious. And certainly, when Eliphaz, when we read Eliphaz's response to Job, they are very. They're uh, as opposed to the other two, Bildad and and Zophar. They are very much theologically oriented. They have a lot more to do with the character and the nature of God. And um, rather than 
some of these ex uh, exterior things that the other two talk about. The, the two, the other two, mm -hmm. tend to talk about God in relationship to man, but Eliphaz seems to concentrate more on mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. as God. The uh, the yeah. other name that he that this me Eliphaz means is God of Gold. L oh, meaning gold. God and Faz, Faz coming from the, the Hebrew word Faz meaning uh, and it's pure gold, refined gold. It's not rough ro gold. So it's a God of refined gold is what literally what the name means. So in some ways you remember that, but it could also mean that a, a goal, a, a God of a refined gold is an idol. You could mm. look at it that way. Because many of the, 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 the idols, the Canaanite idols and the idols of the Middle East, uh, the Assyrians and the Mesopotamians, uh, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, all of them, they all had wonderful images made out of gold. You know, we found, our, uh, archaeology has found a number of them. Um, but they are idols. They portray gods, not, not the one true God. So... Again, this is interesting that Eliphaz would have a name like this. Does this mean that Eliphaz came out of idolatry came out and to come to a worship of the one true, true God? That's something to keep in mind as we continue to read. Hmm. Bildad, who we're introduced to today, believe it or not, I was just looking up the name. origin is uncertain. No one knows what And they the don't name know if it's means. a male or a female and, name. What? You're looking in cars. What are you talking no, about? No, 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 no. It it says here is male or female. They don't know. Most often use it. Most often people use it for a male name, but it could be female too. Means old friendship. Well, that's you know, I looked up a lot of places where every one of them said the origin friendship. the origin is not known. I, I didn't see, I don't know where that's from, but. Hmm. It could mean old friendship. Yeah, old friendship. It could be representative of these are old, Job's old friends, so perhaps, but hmm. every every source that I looked at said they, there was actually no meaning, that, that discernible hmm. meaning of, of the name Bildad. Huh. So, cool. Zophar, who we will, we haven't met yet, but who we will be meeting, right. the third friend of Job, his mm -hmm. name means departing or twittering bird. It could be, mean either one of those. And boy, was he twitting a twittering bird. He was, he was a, he was a tweety, all right. But, the you know, all three of them were, were twittering birds to the ears of Job, but his 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 means means departing now that'll be interesting so far departing from what mm -hmm. again this goes back to elephants is he departing from idolatry is he departing from the truth is departing he departing from, from his friendship departing from his friendship i don't know you know huh? as a, a twin departing from but, god <laughs> and of course the last of job's friends is the youngest and of course he will he she wait or did you do him? is is elihu oh elihu which is a, a popular yeah. name in the Bible. And Elihu means he is my God. Hmm. And that very much describes Elihu. Elihu, I don't have an issue with his name because he's the one that speaks a lot of wisdom when it comes. Sorry, getting warm. He's the one that, sp that speaks the, the most wise counsel to Job about God. And, and the Lord commends Elihu at the end of, at the hmm. end of all these... Uh, this discussion so I, I just thought i'd share that with you before we go on just so that you you keep in mind that these names have particular meanings and the meanings are i, I I'm, I'm trying to get how the, it fits in with the things that they're saying and the, mm -hmm. especially about the things they're saying about god you know um job particularly is is kind of disconcerting to me that it means yeah. that. I, I think that's one of the things Hate. that we really need. If anybody has an idea <laughs> while we're while we're going through this study, that how you can see this tied into the things that Job, you know, that that'd be great. But I just thought it was very interesting. So, 
We come to Bildad. This is the first time. The one whose name either means nothing or it means something that we don't know about or it means old friends. Friendship. I'm inclined to believe the first because more, the more I looked, the more it was they really didn't know. However, we'll start at verse 1. Um, I'll remind you what, jo what Job verse 7 says, hon. Do, read 21, verse 21. Why then do you not pardon my transgression? I'm trying to imitate <laughs> Eric. Forget I can't. It. I can't. You can't. <laughs> Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will be, I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. Okay, so remember, this is Job speaking right. to God now. Job chapter 8. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, How long will you speak these things, and the words of your mouth be like a strong wind? Does God subvert judgment, or does the Almighty pervert justice? If your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgression. If you would earnestly seek God, and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you, and prosper your rightful dwelling place. Though your beginning was small, yet your latter end would increase abundantly. So, Bildad is saying, he listens to Job, the author, and the response we're going to find throughout the book of Job is, is always the same. Whenever Job says something, it's almost like his friends were never listening or listening with their ears closed. They they didn't they weren't trying to understand at all what Job was saying. You know, Job is in a desperate strait. Mm -hmm. I had Anne read seven twenty one to you so that we rem remember he's talking to God. He's desperate. Remember he's saying, I want God to take my life. I, I, I don't want to live I hate my life now. I want him to take it. And Bill Dad's kind of poo pooing the whole thing, going <clears throat> How long are you going to say such things? You well, know? he's actually twisting Job's words of uh, chapter 6, 26. You say? Yeah. Do you intend to rebuke my words and the speeches oh, right. of a desperate one? Yeah. Which are as wind. Okay, so Job so used kind of that twisting, metaphor. Yeah. And now Bill Dad's turning the, uh -huh. the metaphor against him. Right. He's saying, Your words are like blustering winds. Mm -hmm. All right? They're, they're just blowing. You're, you're just a blowhard. You know, you're saying all these things. Remember that what we said, that, God, that Job is speaking out of the anguish of his spirit. We've yes. all been there, anguish of his mm -hmm. soul. And we've all been there as human beings, but they don't, they don't understand. They don't get it, nor does it sound like they want to, that they want to understand. They're, they're just so, we met people, they're just, they've got blinders <laughs> on. They're so yeah. intent on, on protecting God's integrity with Job, so to speak, that they won't, they, there's only one thing that they want to hear Job say and said, I have sinned. They want to hear Job say what the what the prodigal son said. I have sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. They hear that from Job, then they're then they're okay. They're fine because that's that's what they think is the issue. But he says, "Does God pervert justice?" Again, this goes back to we've said it many times. The justice of God is is sometimes a mystery unto itself. You want to say something? Uh -huh. Um, a mystery unto itself because we have this concept of fairness as opposed to justice and fairness and, and we always say that fairness is a human concept um, God is not fair he is just and we want him to be just we do not want him to be fair because for if he were to be fair then the sentence against sin, against all human beings who sin but do not repent, and that is the death of the soul in the second death. He said, well, if I'm going to sentence you to death, I'll have to sentence everybody else to death because that would be fair. That would just be fair. It wouldn't be fair just you to go. But God is just because, and because of the way he, because he's holy, because of how he feels about sin. And so by his justice, he, by justice, he can separate the sheep from the goats. Fairness puts the flocks all together, mixes them all up, and then, you know, one for all and all for one. 
So let's see, what's Bildad doing here? He's, is he arguing that God can't ever pervert justice? And so he must have sinned, right? Him and his children must have sinned. He deserved what he's getting because he's a sinner. Yeah, exactly. That's you deserve right. it, Job. I'm, I mean, in verse in verse four, he's actually saying that he, mm -hmm. he's saying, you know, Job, you're 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 moaning against God because you've lost everything. So you've lost your children. You've lost your your welfare. Your uh, welfare. Your wealth. Your property. You've lost everything. And you're saying that God is not just in doing on that. On top of telling him that he's full I'm, of hot I'm air. Telling, yeah. <laughs> and Joke and Bill, Dad, air. Bill Dad's making the argument, <laughs> you know, just look what happened to your children. Mm -hmm. Your children obviously sinned against him yeah. and gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Like father, like son. Ouch. If right? your children were, were destroyed because of sin then what's happening to you is because of sin as well. And look at their example. And if you don't heed their example, same thing's going to happen to you. But Bildad must have known that he he made sacrifices for his children's sins every day. Well, like, you know, so... I'm, I'm, I'm sure he did, but he's not... Again, they're not... Which proves that he was a righteous man because he was very mindful of how God looked at them and what was going on in their lives just in case his children did sin i mean didn't build that he must have known these things and yet well, I, he still sits here and accuses him of things you know i'm not sure no i mean when when it says in job in job one where where the children remember they shared each other's houses they went around yeah. and ate dinner mm -hmm. and job said he would pray for them he prayed for his children and what was his, the caveat there? He prayed for his children just in case they had sinned against the Lord and didn't but know. But I think it says also that he, he made sacrifice for them. He made sacrifice. That was part yeah, of the sacrifice yeah. of... he. But the problem is you cannot make an offer, a, a sacrifice again for sin for someone else. It's mm -hmm. only you. Repentance only works for you. You have to repent yourself. Mm -hmm. And God, so it sounds like Bildad here is using the example... He's, he's saying it's obvious to us, your, your children are, by the justice of God, God would not have destroyed them if they, had, if, if they weren't sinful, if they hadn't disobeyed, if, if disobeyed him. And he said, and now he talks about repentance. And he does, and so they understood repentance, because he says here in verse 5, but if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty, if you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. Now, what's interesting here is this sounds like repentance. Now that I read this, this sounds like repentance, but it really isn't. No. Because if you will seek God's secret uh, earnestly, yes. Hebrews 11, 6 says... Um, that he who would please God must believe that he is and, and is a rewarder of those who seek him diligently. Seek him. So Bill Dad's right here with this mm -hmm. first line. But if you will seek God earnestly, and that's what we all desire. We all desire and to seek God. And he keeps repeating the word if. If. Yes. Right? Yes. If. Job. If you had only. Yes. If. <laughs> if you will seek God. Yeah. And here's where he kind of. Again, tactics to the enemy, whether Bildad realizes or not, tactic of the enemy. You mix the, the truth with, with untruth, like this one, so to two, speak. So if you seek God three, earnestly and three, yes. plead with the Almighty, repentance isn't pleading. Because pleading is... No. pleading Or is, apologizing. Or apologizing. <laughs> you know, he, he, repentance is not that much deeper than that. It, it, it's much deeper than that. And plead, yeah. your focus is pleading with God to change his mind. But you need to change your mind first. Repentance means you change your mind. You change your way first. You change. You recognize that you're going in the wrong direction. That, that you're going away from God. You choose to turn around and ask God to forgive you. You don't plead with God to forgive you because you know that God is a loving holy god and he will if, if, if we repent what's that line in um 
Oh, first, Sean, if we are faithful to admit our sin, faithful to the, the, the line I'm thinking of, confess. Is, confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all, all iniquity. Again, the 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 initial action is us. We we have to if we are faithful. Again, if like Anne says of Bildad, giving us an if. Yep. Yeah. But that just that just proves his presumptuous nature. He's very presumptuous. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like he's but this presumes a lot. Understanding that that to pull to you come before God like you're a cringing subject or a slave, mm. and and you fall down and you plead with Him. Remember the parable of the wicked, the the, the wicked um, servant, the one who owed all the debt to the king, right? And he pleaded with the king to renege, you know, I will pay you that. Forgive me, I can't pay this. And the king forgave him the debt. But then this man went out and found his fellow servant who owed him a little money, and that servant pleaded with him, but he didn't need that. This is where pleading. It depends on who you're pleading to, right? But I don't think God really wants us. What what's this say? I don't I don't think they got. Oh God, nine fifteen. I can only plead with my judge for mercy. Plead again. This is before the Lord Jesus Christ, and and plead. It's thinking about like a courtroom. You plead before the judge. That's basically. Um, the cross reference I have here, if you plead with the Almighty, goes to Job nine fifteen, and it talks about the metaphor of a courtroom. Mm -hmm. Job says, "Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I can only plead with my judge for mercy." I mentioned this yesterday. When we get to, to chapter nine, it's 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 a very very important, and, and we'll be talking more about this whole idea of of repentance uh, of mm -hmm. what it should look like in pleading, mm -hmm. but. He's saying, you plead with the Almighty. If you are pure and upright, you cannot be pure and upright without God, without his spirit in you. You cannot. God, in the Old Testament, it says that our righteousness, what we are, is like filthy rags to God. There is not one righteous, no, not one. That's right. He says it That's over right. and over again. You can, Without God, you cannot be pure and upright. But here, Bildad is mistakenly telling Job, if, if, if you clean yourself up, and you make yourself upright and pure and everything, God will accept you. You know what strikes me in all this is that he's callous to identify with Job's pain. Oh, well, that's he just we're... wants to stick to his... Well, we were talking about that. They, he, these guys can't empathize. His, yeah, you're yeah, right. His orthodox, arguing, whatever. Arguing doctrine. Arguing what he believes about God. Yeah. You know, and this is, this is subtle. This is subtle stuff, right? It sounds right, but... You know, it, it, and you wouldn't know it unless you had the Holy Spirit and you knew, were you were familiar with the scriptures and what it teaches yeah. about repentance and about the nature of God and the life of the Son of God that's being mm -hmm. formed in each and every one of us. If you are poor and upright, you cannot be pure and upright without God. Even now, he will rouse himself on your behalf. Okay, so only if you show yourself, prove yourself, and this is what Jesus said. It's not by works, but by faith. James says that too. It's not by works. Yeah. Paul says that. But that build that saying is by your works. If you show yourself pure, and then God will rise up and defend you and restore you to your prosperous state. Again, referring to he was one of the richest, he was the richest man in Uz. Uz he's or, telling Job, seek God. Seek God. <laughs> and he said, your beginnings will seem humble, again, but it will grow um, so prosperous will your future be that and, and from that we kind of hear we, we kind of hear echoes of Jesus when he talked about faith being like a mustard seed the smallest seed in the garden but when you plant it yeah. it grows into the biggest tree mm -hmm. where even birds nest in its branches mm -hmm. your beginnings are humble but your, your your future will be prosperous you will you will turn this but again that's like the carrot and the stick you know you'll get all this stuff back Job but only, uh, but it's impossible with the way Bill Dad's presenting it to him. It's not possible for him to do that. Mm. And then he says, uh, oh, and then we're going to go verses 8. So we're down to verse 7. So let's go to verse 8. 
for inquire please of the former age, and consider the things discovered by their fathers. For we were born yesterday, and know nothing, because our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you, and tell you, and utter words from their heart? So, this reminds me, I don't know if it's in here, that's First Chronicles. Okay, again, always looking back to the past. And we do too. All, all of our knowledge, and, and especially since we're talking about the things of God and we're talking about the Bible, all our theology, everything that we understand, every time, everything that we come to cherish about the Bible has been taught to us. It comes from yeah. latter, the generations that came before us. Just as we are mm -hmm. to teach the generation that comes after us that the Lord should tarry. But he's saying, look at the former generations and find out what their ancestors learned. For we were only born yesterday and know nothing. And our days on earth are but a shadow. Mm -hmm. We've seen that metaphor before. Um, Job used that himself, you know, the, the brevity of life, how short life is. And it's, you know, it's ordained for man. We, we quote this all the time. It's ordained for man to live once and then the judgment. Best be making the, the best use of these three score and ten years the Lord gives us. The seven years that, that the biblical seven years that we have. And because our days are so short, we need to. Right. We need to make every effort to learn and, 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 and find eternal life while we are here in the body. The New Testament teaches that too. But what this reminds me is what Paul says. That, remember when he's talking about the history of Israel? And he says, these things were written down for our instructions. Yes. So that we, A, we wouldn't make the same mistakes they made. And B we would we would understand our God better. We would understand the Lord. Well, there's another verse, too, that says all scripture is given for admonition. Admonition, yeah, same no, idea. No, and same thing. It's, it's the same idea, but learning from the past, very mm -hmm. important. We must learn from the past. Lord Acton has that famous acronym. He's, he spoke long ago. Those that do not learn from the past are condemned to repeat, to repeat it. it. Yeah. Okay, and that, that's what Bill Dad is saying, and quite rightly, we need to learn from all those who have gone past. That's what the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about, learning from the past. And the book of Ecclesiastes suggests to us that there's nothing new under the sun, mm -hmm. right? Everything that has happened has happened before. Repeat and repeat. That's mm -hmm. right. And especially in our day and age, we think that this, you know, I remember when COVID first hit and everything and, and how they bandied around that word unprecedented. And it wasn't unprecedented. This is just one of many plagues that hit mankind. You know, the one before that being merely a hundred years before the Spanish influenza, but you go way back, you know, the Black Death and everything back to the biblical plagues in Egypt and the plagues throughout the plagues that, that struck Israel when David took the census. The reason he built the temple where it was. Mm -hmm. Or where it is so so verse 11 um and so he's saying from those from what happened and again he's kind of echoing the book of ecclesiastes here will they not instruct you and tell you he's talking about the generations and mm -hmm. the experiences and the history that they have will they not bring forth words, words from, their from their understanding heart. right because they, they went through these same things and this, the, the same conclusions they reach will be the same conclusions you reach. Mm -hmm. And then he starts, he's using, he starts using a metaphor here in verse 11. Can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can the reeds flourish without water? While it is yet green and not cut down, it withers before any other plant. So are the paths of all who forget God, and the hope of the hypocrite shall perish, whose confidence shall be cut off, and whose trust is a spider's web. He leans on his house, but it does not stand. He holds it fast, but it does not endure. So he talks, he starts giving the metaphor of papyrus. Of course, papyrus, as, as, as 
you know, was the writing material of the ancient world. They mm -hmm. didn't have paper. Paper was invented by the Chinese later on through, uh, I think it was silkworms. I could be wrong about that. that I know that's silk, but um, anyway, they used papyrus. Paul wrote on papyrus. All the letters of the apostles were written on papyrus. It was the, it was the paper of their day. And papyrus is just a, 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 a big, tall uh Read, read, read. Yeah. and it has to grow in a marsh. It doesn't grow anywhere else. That's, that's why. Right. That's why papyrus is so plentiful on the banks of the Nile in Egypt. Yeah, in one Egypt. of the main sources of papyrus, but also on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Mesopotamia, and that's where they learned to make this papyrus mm -hmm. to be able to write on that. And he's saying, can a papyrus grow where there's no marsh, and can reeds thrive without water? Again, what he's arguing here well, is... Well, he's saying God wouldn't be punishing you unless you had sinned. You know, he rewards the righteous. He rewards the righteous. But, you he's, know, so... but he says, how, how can you... The way I kind of read this is, and that's true, huh? but I also think that what he's saying here is, how can you expect to be a papyrus, uh, 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 something that God can write on, if you, you you have no water you have you're not you're not where you're supposed to be water here could be referring to the spirit of god as it is elsewhere throughout through um the scriptures water can it is sometimes it is sometimes used for for a, a, that kind of allegory um and we, and we sort of have that as kind of a we understand that in the uh, the sacrament of baptism you know um we come that we come down we go into the water dead and we arise alive through the spirit of god living through the spirit of god through the life of christ who is in us but he's saying how can god use you he said how can you expect to grow how can you expect to be used if you, if you're not anywhere near god it's sort of what he's what he's wearing fearing at his while still growing and uncut, they wither more quickly than grass. This has to be cut. The papyrus has to be cut quickly, or it right. just rots where it is, and you and it's unusable. Uh, again, may perhaps talking hmm. about the brevity of life here. That you are still growing and uncut, they wither more quickly. You, you are you have to be cut by the Lord in order to be used by Him. Um, but the thing that Bildad, the reason he's using this metaphor, he explains in 13. He said, you, you know, you're, these reeds and these papyruses are growing by the our water, or they're growing uncut, and they're not being God. They're they're not being um, not. They're not being looked after. They're not being harvested no that's probably not the right word either um because without them being tended to they will die and and without allowing god to tend to you what he says is such is the destiny of all who forget god because they grow up and they may look strong and they may look like but then they they rot because they're not cut you know sort of like fruit branches i guess eh? it's like you know that's a the, the vine dresser will come and cut away the, the branches and pruning. He's talking about yeah you know, because the process it, of pruning. It here. draws the nutrients away from the good productive branches. Yeah, all the wasteful yes. branches, and that's, that's why right. they need to be cut off so it can be redirected to the branches that are going to bring bear fruit. That's right. So and and what he's saying here is that somehow job you have forgotten the lord and you become like those papyruses and reeds and you've been, you've been pruned you haven't been pruned because you forgot about him that and your, your destiny is to to lose not only all the papyrus and reeds around you which was your family but you yourself is is going to be eventually cut down like the unfruitful branches we talked mm -hmm. about um thrown into the fire although he doesn't yeah. say that here 
It says, so is the destiny of all who forget God. So obviously he's charging Job here that you've forgotten God. This is this would explain why you were going through the things you were going through. And you perish, and so perishes the hope of the godless. So he's basically saying, you know, again, you've sinned against God. You're godless. You're not God's not even in your life, and it's obvious because you've lost everything. And look at look at you now. Right. Only oh God only to only the godless. This would only happen to the godless. This would only happen to people who who don't have stopped putting their trust in God. And this this is you. And what you're trusting in, Job? Yeah, like his home, his property, his house, his riches, yeah. everything. It's like a spider web. Yeah. It's like there today and a little gust of wind comes and it just blows it away. And he's saying because of you that. Know? Now, I don't know if they heard Job say this, but remember, <laughs> when all this, in chapter 1 and 2, when all or the end of chapter 1, when all the news came to him of all this calamity and all this tragedy in his life, what's Job say? The thing that I feared has come to pass feared or has come upon me. Feared most. Well, what did you fear, Job? See, you feared the loss of your family. You feared the loss of your wealth, of everything that you that you built. That, that God would strengthen. That God had blessed you with. <laughs> you were afraid that you were going to, to, to lose it. And Bildad sort of saying this. When you, when you get into that, when you trust your riches, when you trust in yourself, in this world, when you trust that that you don't, when you say to yourself, and I know because I have a brother who's like this, and I know you all have family members who are like this and friends like this. I do not need God. Oh, I did it myself. I'm doing my. I'm doing just fine yeah. on my own. I got all this on my I own. I don't need him. Mm -hmm. And Bill Dad, and quite rightly, says when you trust, when you're trusting that, it's fragile. It's like you're leaning on a spider's web. Right. Mm -hmm. But it gives way. Your, the weight of yourself because the spider's web was we all know how fragile that is yeah. it's not meant to carry the weight of a human being the weight of a spider is what it's meant to carry and yet when you put all that when you're when you have that much trust in something that is that is practically invisible which is a spider's web and, and has has no power to hold you at all then when calamity and tragedy strike psh, right through the web mm -hmm. right through the spider web it collapses. <laughs> you know, they lean on the web, but it gives way. They cling to it. So once it gives way, they're like trying to cling to the strands of the web, but it does not hold because it's not meant. It's not meant to hold them. Um, and let's go to verse sixteen. Huh? Hagar is green in the sun, and his branches spread out in his garden. His roots wrap around the rock heap and look for a place in the stones. If he is destroyed from his place, then it will deny him, saying, I have not seen you. Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth others will grow. Okay, so now Bildad brings up another metaphor, another allegory. A dogmatic statement. You are like a well-watered plant in the sunshine. <laughs> you looked really healthy. You spread your roots out over the trees, you, even through the stones yeah. and stuff, looking for water. You were all over the garden. You, your, your, your roots were all over the countryside here. Everyone knew you, but now you've been torn from your spot. You've, you've been torn. The roots have been pulled up, and now this, the country, and whether Bill Dad realizes it or not, he and his friends, hmm. but the country of Job's birth, the world, the world itself, is now saying. It disowns you and says, I never saw you. Surely its life withers away. And now because of that, your life has been withered away. And, and from the soil where the other plants, other people are having success. Yeah. They must have the favor of yeah. God. You don't. This reminds me of the curse the, on the land. That too. That's true, <laughs> hon. That's true. But this reminds me of the parable of the seeds. This reminds me of those those seeds that took root yeah. and spread out, but their root system was very, very shallow. And then when the sun came or when the sun came and trials and tribulations mm -hmm. came, the, as Jesus said, the, the, uh, 
the cares of the world came upon that root, it shrank because it didn't, it didn't take a deep root. It shrank and it disappeared. And the seed was disowned by the ground. And almost what, that's almost what this sounds like. And this is what Bill Dad's accusing. He said, your circumstances prove, you know, we all thought you had a deep root and God had spread you, but obviously not. You're, you're one of these seeds, even though they didn't know about the parable of the seeds at that time. He said, you're one of these seeds, Job. You're one of these plants. You know, you look, you know, you look robust, you look hardy enough, you look like you can replicate, but a storm comes and uproots you and it's like you never existed. You were never there. You don't even leave a hole in the ground. So last three verses. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. He will yet fulfill your mouth with laughing and your lips with rejoicing. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. Psalm 113 He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap. Hmm. Which is certainly what he's going to do with Job. Mm -hmm. But Bildad concludes here by saying, If you do these things I'm telling you, Job, you know, if you recognize that you have been leaning on a spider's web, you recognize that you're like these reeds in the water who are growing heedlessly and, and now have been uprooted. You haven't even, even been near any water. Um, but if you, and, and going back, he said, if you, if you remember <laughs> what, what? Oh, nothing. He uses the word blameless. Job, if only you were blameless. If only you were blameless. Right? He said, if I you remember thinking. past generations, <laughs> and he said, if you seek God earnestly, if you do what I tell you, seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty. If you are pure and upright, right? We had talked about that. But why would he, Job is saying, well, why would I? Why would I plead to the Lord? Because I'm not sinful. I don't have... I don't have the sin that you're tell, telling me about. But Bill Dad says with these last few verses, now, if you recognize what we're telling you is the truth, you know, and it's obvious to all of us, and it would be obvious to all the generations that came before us who've seen similar things, he said, and we know God, and we know that God will not reject one who is blameless. You know, what we see here, Job, he's rejected you. So you are obviously not blameless. You know, I'm using logic on the situation. And he won't strengthen, and if you are an evildoer, he won't strengthen your hands. And right now you are as weak as weak can be. Mm -hmm. He said, but if you plead with him and you turn around and you admit your fault and you admit your iniquity and your sin and you, and, and you come to God and you plead with him, then... And, and of course, we know this This is truthful. God will do this, but he does it through a different way rather than the way that Bildad's saying. You know, mm -hmm. He does it through repentance, true repentance. Mm -hmm. This is what the fruits of repentance looks like that John the Baptist was talking about. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed in shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. And that's a promise, and that's and that is a legitimate promise of God for all those that put their trust in Him. But that's the key; it's, yeah. they put their yeah. trust in Him, repent, and put their trust in God. Mm -hmm. Bildad's not telling Job to put your trust in God; he's saying, admit what we all can see with <laughs> our own that you're a sin, yeah. that you're a sinner, and then hopefully God will God will have mercy upon you, and He will exercise His justice, and then all these things will happen. Well, we know it through, now through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and how we understand the New Testament. It doesn't. It, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. We can't. You know, we cannot be pure in in God's sight on our own. We cannot. Yeah. We cannot get there with our own but works, works yeah. and our own righteousness. And that's really important to know. Mm -hmm. Job's friends didn't get it. Well. It Bill Dad's dogmatic statement about how God will not cast away the blameless is 
undermined by the fact that he uses the word blameless in the same way the Lord used it in the prologue. Chapter 1, verse That's 1, right. to when, describe Job. When Satan asks, have you considered... And verse 8, and then in chapter 2, verse 3. That's right. right? That's right. Have you considered my, have my you servant cons Job? Yeah. I should probably, rather than do this. Have you considered my servant Job? Um... Verse 1 in chapter 1, and then verse 8, and also chapter 2, verse 3. That's right. In the land of those, Job 1, Job, Job, Job. 1, 1. In the land of those, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And we should always remember that about Job through this, all these chapters. Same with inverse that eight. never changed. But that's what was being tested. Blameless and upright also in verse 8. And then, the, yeah. It's kind of, yeah, a dogmatic statement. Blameless and upright. Have you mm -hmm. considered my servant Job? And right now they're considering his servant Job. Yeah. Will Job pass the test? Will he show himself to be blameless and upright and righteous before God? Yes, he will. He sure will. But not in the way they think. No, because they mm -hmm. have, you know, they have some misconceptions about how God works. They think, oh, yes. they think they're being, defending the Lord. They think that they have a right view of God and how he works through in men. But, uh, but no one's seen the trouble Job has. He's got a testimony of nope, faith. He does. <laughs> he does. He does. Mm. Well, thank you for that, Bill, Dad. I think we'll think yeah, about that overnight and see what Job has to say about it tomorrow. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I hope that you join us tomorrow. And I, I hope we, we're going to spend a little bit of time because Job 9 is one of those crucial chapters in the book of Job. Mm. Um, and it's crucial because what it talks, what it says about God and the ways of salvation, and I think and things that we need to heed, things that we need to understand. <clears throat> Father, we yes. give you thanks, Lord, yeah. for this time together to read into your Word. Lord, your Word always blesses us, Father. We always come uh, uh, come away from reading it, Lord, with. Uh, with with greater wisdom and greater understanding father and how you, who you of are. who you are lord and you how you view us you. lord and we even have a greater understanding for Jesus. us father as human beings and uh lord we are so thankful we are a grateful people lord that you give us these things lord, yes, lord. to look at to ponder but even greater than that you give us the holy spirit that leads and guides us teaches. in our understanding and teaches us lord god yes teaches us father god the things that we need to know from your word and lord we are thankful for that and lord i pray a mighty blessing father upon all the branches who are with us this morning and i pray a mighty bl uh, blessing upon all those who will watch this video later lord even if they haven't joined us this morning but are going to look later mm -hmm. i pray lord that they will that uh seeds will be planted father god and they will grow into a rich harvest to the glory of your name, Father. Lord, I thank you and I, I pray a, a, a blessing Jesus. upon them, Father, for their going in and their coming out, Lord you, God. Jesus. Father, you know the needs of all your people, <coughs> all the people on this thank channel, you, Lord. Lord. You know before we even ask. Yes, you do. But we come to you, Lord, as your children. We come to you in mm. prayer, Father, asking as a good and loving Father. Amen. And you, Lord will not give us a snake Jesus. when we ask for an egg, nor will you give us a stone if we ask for bread, Lord. But you will give us what we need. Not necessarily mm. what we want, but you mm -hmm. give us what we need. And every day, Lord, you provide for our needs because you know you created us. You know what we need even before we ask. And so, Father, again, oh, gratefully, yeah. we give praise and glory to your name. Yeah, we give thanks, Lord, Lord, for this opportunity to be able to be with you. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you bind us together, cords of love, cords of the Spirit, Amen. cords of the Son of God. We thank you, O God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well.
I hope you will come and join us tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be doing worship tomorrow. I'm just feeling yeah. it. <laughs> we love you. Remember, branches, stay in the vine today. Stay in the vine today because without him, we can do nothing. nothing. And we all want to be fruitful vines for the Lord Jesus Christ. Be a Christ. blessing. Go out be and a be blessing. a blessing. Amen. Amen. Bye. Bye.